the further along you get in your data journey, the more costs are going to become a factor, whether it's for your business or your company or just for your ability to contribute effectively as an individual engineer. And so what I want to do in this video is explain some of the most common cost structures you're going to come across so that you can be more prepared leading your team or contributing at a higher level on any team because you'll be more aware of the implications of these cost structures. Now, one of the biggest changes since even I've been in this game for the last, let's say, 10, 15 years is the separation of compute and storage costs and what that means for tooling and just processing all these things together. So let's break this down. So number one, we have storage costs. This is pretty straightforward. You are storing data onto a disk somewhere and there are costs associated with that. Now, if you store things locally on your computer or your laptop, typically you're not paying extra for that. And we'll talk about that idea a little bit later. But typically you're storing something on the cloud, whether it's a cloud database or a cloud storage. And typically this is charged by gigabyte, maybe by terabyte. But either way, it's a measure of the amount of data that you have, the size of the data. And also, generally speaking, this is a lower amount nowadays compared to the compute side of things, which we'll talk about. Now, it's not nothing and it can over time really add up. So it's something you absolutely want to be mindful of. You don't want to be wasteful storing data if you don't have to be. But at the same time, if it's more strategic, for you to hang on to more data. Generally speaking, it doesn't cost as much as in the past, but there are also ways you can be more optimized with how you store data. For example, if you have data that you know you're not going to touch for many years or maybe only once a year, you can store it in lower temperatures. The more cold something is, that means the less you're going to access it, which means you'll get a discount on how much it'll cost you per gigabyte to store it compared to something that's, let's say, hot. A hot storage is something that you're going to be accessing more frequently. Maybe it's once a week, once a day, once an hour, whatever that looks like. There are are different costs associated with it because you're making it available. So again, generally it is cheaper, but it is a cost nonetheless and something to be mindful of. Now, the other side of this is compute. And when we're talking about computation at a simple level, we're talking about the processing of let's just say queries. So if you're working on a database, let's say it's Snowflake or Redshift or Databricks or any of these common cloud providers, they're going to have your cost for storage and then you're going to have your cost per computing. So it's the cost of running those queries. They're charging you to execute against the data. So you store the data and there's a cost and then you run computation to process that data and that's also a cost but that is typically what costs more now within that there's actually two common pricing models of the computation side of things so one is the time-based pricing so this is where you'll often see things like credits applied you're getting charged based on how much something is running think about it like there's a stopwatch going every time you press query it'll run and depending on how long that takes you're going to get charged and sometimes there's a minimum for how long that goes depending on the platform that you use but either way you're getting charged based on the time Time. The other approach is volume based. And this is where, depending on how much of the data you look at, you'll get charged. So bytes scanned is an approach that you might see. And depending on how much data you process, it's going to determine how much it costs you for that compute side of things. Let's say in a hypothetical scenario, you have a query that takes one second to run, but you process 100 terabytes of data. That same query could cost drastically different depending on if you ran the byte scanned, where you're getting charged for 100 terabytes of scanning compared to the time where it just billed for one second. Now, that's not a truly realistic scenario. You probably wouldn't run into that, but hopefully the example of that helps paint the picture of the differences. So it's something to consider as you evaluate your options, or maybe more importantly, be able to pay closer attention to where you might be racking up extra costs where you could limit them. Understanding cost is just one piece of the larger puzzle of creating a data architecture and whether you are the lead on the team looking to set this up or an individual engineer looking to contribute at a higher value or be able to understand how it all fits into the bigger picture. Then I do have a resource that I think could be really helpful for you. It's completely free. It's called the Modern Data Checklist. It'll give an overview of the four main components of most modern data architectures that you're going to run into, along with individual items to consider to make sure you're covering all of the most important pieces or just to help guide you as you learn a little bit more in your career. So if that's you, there'll be a link in the description below for you to grab a copy for yourself. Again, completely free. But with that said, let's now get back to the video. Now, with that out of the way, I want to take a step back. I mentioned initially the example with the laptop and the cloud comparisons. So it's important to understand saying that the progression of this. So the historical model would be you buy a complete server from a data center or even from the cloud or even just in your local office and everything is on that specific server. So think about again, like a computer or a laptop that you have, you're not getting charged extra depending on how much you run or how much data is on there. You use whatever you can and there's a fixed, typically a one-time fee for that. And if you want to add more storage or more memory, you pay extra to add that on and then that's a one-time fee. But now in a modern, more 
cloud-based model, you're effectively paying as you go with the pricing and you can add it on and scale it up very easily or down if you're not using it. So this works really well for data teams and you can really pay attention to your costs because you can either reduce them a lot by doing certain things to make sure you're not maybe running them as much as you need to or you're not scanning as much as you need to compared to in the past where it was a one-time fee and that's what you pay, which may or may not be more or less than what you need. But regardless of which one you prefer, a lot of companies nowadays are going to be moving to this more cloud-based pay-as-you-go pricing. So it's just important to be aware. And that's really the point of this video here to help you be more aware of these different approaches and these different structures so you can be more knowledgeable and more efficient with how you're building and operating on any team. Now, there's a couple other areas that I want to mention here in terms of pricing and costs you're going to run into. So Number one is the common SaaS tools. There's a lot of tools nowadays. Maybe you can start using them completely free, open source. But then if you want the nice hosted UI version, you pay a monthly subscription fee as a user to their cloud platform. And that's a completely separate price than what we were just talking about for computation. So a lot of tools have this and you might pay per user or per batch of users per month. And that comes with its own set of features. There could be different tiers of support and usage that you get depending on the level of tier that you buy. But again, just from a pure pricing and cost perspective, those SaaS tools are definitely costs you're going to run into. Then we also have data ingestion pricing, which in and of itself can sometimes be a little confusing to figure out, but it's there nonetheless and a cost you need to consider. So the main approaches you'll see there are monthly active rows. So a lot of times they'll bill based on how many new records they're loading in or whatever their definition of an active row is. So however many of those you have, you get billed based on that. This could be in the million. So depending on how many monthly active rows you have will determine the cost. I think of that more like the bytes scan, the volume based equivalent in the data ingestion world. It depends on how much data you're moving. The other could be a credit based approach where you buy computation or usage credits and then you get billed based on however long that takes. Again, that's more of like the time based approach, depending on how many credits it takes to process something will determine your costs. And then there are some that provide a fixed fee based on certain conditions. So maybe for a certain amount per month, you can process X number of rows or run it for X number of hours. It all depends on the tool. They're all a little bit different, but those generally speaking are the main approaches for ingestion. So it's something to be aware of as you evaluate and as you use things to make sure you're not unnecessarily spending money or being at least just efficient with your costs. So these pricing models are definitely something you want to factor in as you select your data ingestion tool. Obviously, in combination with the available connectors they have, the level of service, support, etc., all of which can factor into a complete cost of ownership for a particular tool, which leads nicely into this last point I want to make on this, which is we're talking a lot about cost of usage and subscriptions and all that stuff for individual tools. But the biggest cost of all of this most often is the cost of your time of individuals working. The last time I checked, people don't work for free. People have salaries, you have hourly rates, you have project rates. There are real costs associated with people managing and working on these tools. And it can get hidden a lot of times because it just gets lumped into, let's say, a salary. So you don't really feel it maybe as directly. But the cost of these things is very important to consider as you pick your tools in comparison with the pricing. So for example, you might think you're saving a lot of money because you have an on-site computer with the data server that you can manage for your data team. You're not paying these extra costs for a cloud database. But by doing that, you may be spending actually more money by having somebody constantly checking on it, making fixes, making changes, handling issues just to maintain it to hopefully what you think is saving money. But the cost of that person or multiple people or a team to keep an eye on that for the networking, all the maintenance, all the overhead to do updates might actually be more by a lot compared to what you'll be paying to offload that and pay based on usage as you go. Not always the case, not always true, but it's something I like to call out and that I think is important to consider as you're evaluating options. I think one of the best ways you can be the most efficient with your time is to create really well-structured data architectures and data pipelines. For example, if you have something that you know is based on byte scans, so you're gonna get billed on the amount of data you're processing, you can take steps to implement things like indexes or design your queries in a way that have filters so that you're not processing more data than you need and therefore reducing your costs, making everything more efficient and saving everybody money in the process. Hopefully now you have a better understanding whether as an individual contributor or team leader of how pricing factors into data architectures and creating really cost-effective data pipelines. Thanks as always for watching and I'll see you at the next video.